was that that was very greatly appreciated. So I just want to highlight a few different things um, in regards to the features on MS Teams. So we've, we've noted that um, depending on the day that you, you join in, you might not have all the access to all the different features. So hopefully you have at least the chat feature uh, where in the chat you'll be able to put um, maybe a thumbs up or a happy face. Uh, if you don't have access to that chat, um, you should hopefully have at least the hands up icon, which is in that top or should be in that top right corner. Sometimes it could be in different places depending on your on your uh, device that you're working off of. Uh, so you can use that and we'll ask you to unmute yourself at that time. But for now, I'm just gonna ask everyone again uh, just to mute yourselves and um, we are going to start the presentation. But if you do wanna participate in some way and you can't because you can't access that chat, uh, just raise your hand and we will get you to um, just unmute yourself at that point and and uh, you can ask your question or um, participate the way you, you'd like to. Uh, so just so that everyone is aware, this session is being recorded. However, I want everybody to note that the chat itself is not being recorded. So I'm going to try to refrain from using um, any of the uh, names or anything else just to keep everything um, more confidential. Uh, but note that if you do raise your hand and we ask you to unmute yourself, uh, this will actually be part of the that recording. So I'm going to be turning off my camera shortly. I want to make sure that we maximize our bandwidth as much as possible, and hopefully it will alleviate any technical issues that may arise. Um, this will also allow you to focus a little bit more on that presentation as opposed to me. <laughs> so um, I will come back though at the end of the presentation in order to address any of the comments or questions that you may have. Uh, so before we get started, does anybody have any questions or anything else that they wanted to ask before? Uh, before we get started. Okay, so I think we are good to go. Okay, so I'm before we get started, um, I just wanted to highlight a few things. So the presentation that you are about to view is the intellectual property of the Department of National Defense, and any reproduction or retransmission of the slides contained in this presentation is strictly forbidden. Some of the topics discussed in this webinar may be of a sensitive nature and not appropriate for children, so we do ask that, that there is some parental discretion there. Uh, please understand that people's stories are their own to tell, and anything that is shared by participants in this webinar is not to be discussed outside of this webinar. The webinar, as I mentioned before, is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on on calfconnection.ca. Though active participation is strongly encouraged, and we will try to prompt you a few times, uh, you may simply follow along without uh, using that chat or the video or microphone functions if you do prefer. Okay, I just thought I'd um, provide you all with a list of available resources, both locally and nationally, to ensure that you have the supports in place to navigate through these unprecedented times. Remember, no issue is too small to reach out and gain some of that extra support. There has definitely been some extra added stressors and pressures placed on all of us over these last 14 months. And I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of the systems that are in place in order to support us. I'm going to leave the slide up uh, for a little bit just in case you want to jot some of those numbers down. Um, I will also populate it again at the end of the presentation with a few different resources that um, may be more particular to uh, what we are going to be presenting today. So in the chat, I think Dana's busy typing away. Uh, we just wanted to know who is actually joining us. So um, are you a military member, maybe a, a civilian employee, a family member? If you could just use your, um, your reaction icons and maybe give us a thumbs up in regards to any of those. And I'm just realizing that I need to mute those because I'm seeing everybody's contents here. So give me one second, I just need to... Okay, come back. Okay, so we've um, we've got some Canadian Armed Forces members, some defense team. Okay, perfect. So thank you all for joining us today. So as I was creating this presentation, I started to think about. Oh, I'm not able to. 
navigate these slides. All right. Um, I, I started thinking about what to include. So I started thinking that there are so many things that can upset our basic sense of well-being. One of these oftentimes is being other people. Our tendency when things bother us is to blame the other per person or even situation for getting it wrong and thus causing our suffering. Once we have identified what we consider the cause of our disturbance, we usually set out to try and fix it. We attempt to change the other person's behavior or the situation into something that we consider right, or at least something that won't bother us. There is no doubt that people and situations can be the cause of our discontent. For instance, if a friend speaks unkindly to me, I'm gonna feel hurt, a direct result of their choice of words. There is nothing wrong with trying to change a situation that we don't like or that makes us unhappy. Such efforts are actually wise and adaptive and a way of taking agency in our lives. We need to try to change what's not working if we can. But what happens when we are not successful at changing those around us and we can't change those situations that are causing us pain? I guess we can call that plan B. So we need to tr switch that perspective and turn our attention inward by asking ourselves sometimes some difficult questions. For instance, what does this situation or person's behavior trigger in me? Or what pain is generated in me when I am confronted with these behaviors or these realities? As stated on this slide, the one thing that we can't control is anyone else's behavior. We can't make any we can't make another person want to or even be able to change. But what you can control is your own intent, your own frequency, your own responses, your own thoughts, and your own actions towards yourself as well as towards others. So recognizing that the better we learn to communicate, the more likely our ideas and our thoughts are going to be welcomed and accepted by others. So why waste our energy trying to control what we can't control? Why not just focus on what you can control, which is ultimately you and how you choose to communicate your wants, your needs, and your desires. So in this presentation, we will define and discuss the various channels of communication while exploring the impact of aggressive, passive, and assertiveness on our exchange. We're gonna evaluate how triggered thoughts and coping thoughts can play a role in our communication while concluding with a few guidelines and strategies to ascertain a more productive way of expressing ourselves. So what is communication? Basically, it is an exchange of information that has two parts, one being for the speaker to express their message in a way that the other person will hear and understand, and the second being for the listener, whose role is to listen with an intent to understand the message from the other person. So I just wanted to engage you guys in the chat a little bit, and I want you to jot down a few ideas or skills that you think might lead to a safe and respectful conversation. What are some of those things that can be done that help to ensure that you have a good conversation? Any ideas in regards to that? So just in the chat there, I don't know if everybody has the chat, but hopefully you do. If you don't, if you want to raise your hand. <laughs> Distractions. Good, good. I see that somebody is typing, so I'm just going to keep, keep, keep the line open a little bit. Yeah, being open-minded, good. So anything basically can, um, there's so many things that you can incorporate. So things like paraphrasing to ensure that both parties are on the same page. Maybe it's being aware of our body language, uh, incorporating maybe some eye contact, um, maybe some minimal encouragers like mm-hmm or yes or, I see um, making sure that you are not being judgmental, maybe minimizing those distractions as pointed out in that chat, um, mirroring, reflecting other people's emotions, um, not making any assumptions about what the other individual is trying to convey, allowing sometimes a person to finish their sentence before we start to formulate a response. Even respecting sometimes that silence. Oftentimes we, we try to pepper people with too many questions. Uh, so it makes it more difficult for them to answer. 
When approaching a difficult conversation, it might even be wise to come up with a plan. Uh, so maybe writing your thoughts down. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'm actually going to uh, provide you with a, a simple tool that you can do or you use um, in order to try to mitigate that a little bit more effectively as well. So when we think of communication, we might focus most of our attention on that verbal language. Those are the words that we use. However, there's actually three channels of communication. So not only do we have our words, but we also need to consider our body language, which is our facial expression and our body posture, and our paralanguage, which is how we express our words through our inflection, our speed, maybe it's our tone of voice. And to be an effective communicator, these actually need to align. And we need to be aware of these and communicate them to the other party if for some reason they aren't in alignment. Stephen Covey, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, noted that the first rule of communication is to seek first to understand and then be understood. This is basically approaching every conversation in a curious manner and checking our assumptions at the door. Just in the chat, has anybody ever approached a conversation based on those assumptions? Maybe you, you might want to even just put your hands up. Maybe that's an easier way of kind of doing that. Anybody ever approach their, a conversation um, with some assumptions in regards to what, what is being talked about or what the other person's intents are? Absolutely. So. If we attempt to understand, we are more likely to gain respect and credibility. Yeah, absolutely. So somebody had written in the conversation, oh yes, it, it made it even more stressful. Um, yeah, when it didn't necessarily need to be. So yeah, those assumptions, we need to check those at the door. So if we attempt to understand, we are more likely to gain that respect and credibility. The better we learn to communicate, the more likely our ideas and our thoughts will be welcomed by others. People need to feel heard and allowing that process to happen where we approach the conversation in a curious manner using some of those open-ended questions and those active listening skills that we've been learning, we are more likely to ensure that we understand the other party's point of view. So next I just wanted to um, explore and unpack the following behaviors and their definitions uh, for the use in this presentation. So when we look at that aggressive behavior, that's on the top left uh, corner there, um, we are talking about an intent to do harm. This is usually felt in an intensive way. We might not use the word aggressive, um, you know, in a non-invasive way where we tell our child to go out on the rink and be aggressive out there in their play. But for the intent of this presentation itself, we are viewing that aggression in that intent to do harm. It's basically used more in a threatening manner than a let's get things done manner. Uh, so bringing your attention now to the far right of, or the top right of the screen, that's that passive behavior. And this is more or less an avoidance as to not deal with a situation or person. This is usually, um, usually the individual re will resort to this when they don't know what else to do. They are unable to stand up for themselves and they may take um, abuse despite the desire for a different outcome. Remember that avoiding dealing with a situation is only submissive if it is not what you really want to do. It is often used to avoid con conflict, um, but that can lead to that doormat response. This can be actually a healthy behavior when you think of it, when considering the fact that sometimes you need to pick your battles. You don't necessarily need to attend to every argument that's out there or even being part of the Canadian Armed Forces. This is um, oftentimes the only way of responding to a direct order, despite whether you agree with the command or not. So recognizing that there is room for that passive behavior, um, but it's not, it's not um, the go-to, um, and it's not um, basically something that you're using um, in, in order to not get your needs met. So shifting our attention now to that assertive behavior. This is shifting our, our um, shifting things. Uh, the, the last one that um, 
that we talked about. So that assertive behavior is ideally, we want to strive to engage more in this type of behavior. Being assertive is stating what your experience is and what you want in a way that is respectful to others. The focus is on that problem and how to resolve it while respecting ourselves and the others that are involved. So out of curiosity, um, does anybody, um, basically identify a little bit more with any of these types of behavior. Maybe your approach is more towards that aggressive behavior. Maybe you're more often leaning towards that passive behavior. Um, or would you consider yourself somebody who's more in that assertive zone? Just to see where, where you guys are at. Anybody, anybody identify with one of those a little bit more frequently than, than another? Yeah. Okay, so sometimes can be passive and assertive. Absolutely, good. Thank you for answering that. So what I did was I plotted these um, behaviors on a spectrum with an attempt to understand this a little bit further. So focusing our attention first and foremost on the far left of this spectrum. After having reviewed the definition um, that we, we just talked about, um, remembering that um, when we're talking about that aggressive, we are looking at that intended to harm. So in the chat again, I'm just gonna get you guys to respond. How would you recognize when someone is being aggressive? What are maybe some of the words that people might use? Maybe it's their gestures, um, maybe it's their parallel language or their voice cues. What is it that you observe when somebody is more in that aggressiveness? Yes, yelling, all right, good. <laughs> Any others? Pointing finger. demeaning language, blaming, absolutely. Uh, so now what I wanna do is I wanna move into that passive. Uh, so if we move to the far right side of there. Um, so how would you, how might you recognize if someone is more passive in their behavior? Yeah, in your face for the aggressiveness. Okay, maybe somebody's more shy, they're more meek in their approach. I see that people are typing, so I'm just gonna give it a little, little second. Yeah, they might actually change their mind, so they, they might be a little bit more wishy-washy in regards to that. Okay, perfect. So in regards to the assertiveness, so lastly, I wanted to take a look at that um, assertive manner. What are things that you may recognize in someone who is expressing themselves in an assertive way? Any thoughts or ideas in regards to that assertive? What does somebody look like when they're being assertive? Okay, so uh, change the mind to support uh, what others want. They are using more of those I statements. They might be more confident, clear. Good, excellent. I see somebody else is typing, so I'm just gonna give it a second. More so two-week conversation, absolutely. And they're looking at more in that problem-solving way. Good. So now that we've identified, um, I wanted to, uh, I identified what it looks like to be in those. I wanted to point out that the two far ends of the spectrum are both instinctive reactions. These actually arise from our classic response to stress, which could be that fight or flight, um, or even if you wanna include the freeze in there as well. This is basically our tripwire or our go-to in order to protect ourselves. Neither one of those is being right or wrong. It's simply our automatic response to that situation. But when we explore that, that assertiveness, so the middle part of that spectrum, this is not an instinctive behavior, um, but more of a learned response. It is actually a conscious, conscious choice of behavior. And this is actually somewhere where that you can learn, you can develop this. Um, but like strengthening any neuro pathway that is out there, this is something that we need to practice. So looking at these and kind of relating to them to that communication, aggressive communication is basically um, usually at that expense of others. 
it's that need to win the argument by overpowering, threatening, maybe you're finger pointing, you're shaking your fist or stepping into someone else's personal space. The individual is usually loud, maybe they're abusive, they're rude. They could even use sarcasm in order to, to, to list that approach. While a passive communicator, they might indirectly let others know um, their needs by dropping hints or maybe they're even bringing in a third party and talking to them instead. They tend to avoid, postpone, or, um, or even hide from conflict in an effort to gain approval from others. They might be even thought of as nice or even selfless by placing the uh, other people's needs above theirs. Often these individuals may fluctuate between submission and aggression. Uh, so back to that, I think somebody had said that they sometimes go into that passive aggressive. And this has the likelihood to send those mixed messages. So while the assertive communicator expresses themselves openly and honestly while respecting others, they're going to shift their attention away from the person and they're going to focus more on the problem and identifying some solutions that are out there. Their body language and choice of words are usually clear and they're calm. They're looking more at diffusing the situation and take responsibility for their own decisions and actions. Remembering that this response is not intrinsic, but it can be learned. I absolutely love this quote. Anyone can become angry. That part is easy, but to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose and in the right way, that part is not easy. So in order to understand anger, we actually need to understand stress because anger is an emotion that is derived by our stress. So if you've participated in any of our briefings in the last couple of weeks, whether it was our anger presentation or the one on stress, you would have probably seen a model that's very similar to this. So this is how stress happens. Usually there's an event or a situation that actually presents itself, and that could be either real or it could even be perceived. It doesn't necessarily need to be real, but if it is perceived by that individual to be real, uh, then it, can, it, it is classified as a stressful event or situation. And then it goes through something that we call the mental filter. This is basically where we tell our story a story, the story about what has just happened, what happened in that stressful event or situation. And dependent on that story, this is basically going to determine whether you're able to manage your stress effectively or whether you're not able to manage it effectively. So through a show of hands, I so if you can find your or locate your hands button, um, I just want to know how many of you actually agree with this statement? So how we perceive an event, whether positive or negative, has a greater impact on how we respond than on the event itself. Do you guys agree with that? Any thoughts? Yeah, okay, so we've got a few hands up. Absolutely. Oh, just to give you guys a, a, a simple example, um, in light of our current situation, many of us have had to relearn how to conduct our business in more of a virtual setting. If your experience has actually been something that's more frustrating with potentially you've had connectivity issues or maybe you're at needed, you bought a new computer and you needed to learn a new technical device and uh, you weren't familiar with it or maybe you had to learn to try to navigate a million different platforms that are out there. If your experience was riddled with dysfunction and inability to perform at a standard that you yourself are used to you might find yourself more stressed over delivering a presentation than somebody else or than if you had to do it in your, your normal work day. This might unravel you, it may seem very stressful, while someone else who had maybe an easier time navigating the virtual world may basically welcome those opportunities to do that. So ultimately, how the person interprets or even perceives a situation is critical. Recognizing that even an imaginary threat is going to produce that stress. Similarly, an individual may be surrounded by a whole bunch of real threats and may never feel, they might feel perfectly calm in that situation. So 
I just wanted to, to engage you uh, again in the chat. So using the chat here again, I wanted to take a moment to explore with you what you believe may impact one's perception of a situation or event. So I just talked talk to you guys a little bit about a past experience. So if your past experience with your computer, your technology and everything else was going really wrong, maybe you were having a hard time to kind of get there. What else do you think might influence your, um, your perception of a situation? Any ideas in regards to that? Fatigue, yes, being tired, maybe not reaching those, the recommended seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Fatigue is a big one. Yeah, somebody else noted that as well. Oh, maybe so somebody else has uh, put in their HALT, which is basically uh, that acronym. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? Where is it that you're actually sitting? Because oftentimes hang being hangry is uh, a, a definite emotion that a lot of people undergo. Um, you know, are you angry in, uh, during the situation? Are you lonely or maybe are you tired? So perfect. Thank you so much for adding that. So when we look at our interpretation of events, so we've already talked about past experiences, but sometimes it could be our present circumstances, um, you know, being tired or um, maybe being sick or um, maybe you're up all night with a sick child. Uh, you know, there's different reasons why our present circumstance um, might be influenced by um, that, that anger generating situation. Maybe it's even perceiving something um, as a as a danger or a threat. Uh, so I don't know, maybe you've had some uncomfortable moments with your neighbor and they ask you to move your car and um, you know, you're kind of like, why am I having to move my car? Maybe you perceived it as a, a threat when basically they were just trying to, you know, do some work on their roof or, you know, something of the sort and they didn't want your car to get damaged. Um, maybe it's feeling that lack of control over something. Oftentimes divorced parents may actually feel this way. Uh, for instance, if uh, one of the individuals actually moved to a different school zone um, and now all of a sudden you need to drive an extra 10 to 15 minutes in order to get your child to that, that zone. Or maybe judging something to be a problem. How effective are you going to be if you're entering a brainstorming um, session and you've already determined that something isn't going to work? Maybe it's jumping to conclusions. Uh, you know, maybe you've gone into work and you had an altercation with one of your coworkers and you try to um, basically rectify that. You've had that discussion. You think everything's good to go. At the end of the day, they are leaving and you wave to them goodbye. And as you're waving to them goodbye, they basically don't wave back. And you jump to that conclusion of, I guess they're not over it. Or, um, you know, as opposed to flipping that um, that switch and kind of saying, well, maybe they didn't see me or they must be preoccupied with something else. Uh, so maybe you're jumping to those conclusions. So there, our interpretation of events can actually have a huge impact on how we deal with things. So once a situation has occurred, there's usually two types of thoughts uh, that can follow. They're going to be either coping thoughts or trigger thoughts. I actually just gave you guys an example in regards to that when I was talking about the jumping to conclusions. One, the trigger thought would be basically, well, obviously they're not over it, while a, a coping thought would be more or less that um, response where, oh, maybe they didn't see me or they must be preoccupied with something else. So recognizing that trigger thoughts intensify your emotions, our physical sensation and our actions, they actually create a reactive response to the stressful situation. So an exam another example of a trigger thought uh, would be, for instance, if you came home from grocery shopping and when you walk in, the TV is on and it's blaring and um, your child is watching it and you need some help in regards to unpacking those groceries. So you walk in and you request that the TV be turned off and you ask your child to come and help you. You wind up in the kitchen and there's still, you know, the TV is still blaring and there's no little helpers to follow. A trigger thought would be stating something like, like the following. So, oh gosh, he's always ignoring me or I'm sick of having to tell him over and over to turn off the TV or he's always so disrespectful. All of these statements are most likely going to escalate you emotionally. 
While on the other hand, that coping thought basically helps us to decrease our emotions, our psychological sensations, um, or sorry, our physiological sensations and our actions. They allow for us to have a calm response. So instead of allowing that self-talk to go to those trigger thoughts, it might be switching that perspective and maybe coming up with some coping thoughts to de-escalate the situation. For instance, you know, maybe they didn't hear me or they are distracted by the TV and uh, he's not doing this on purpose. He's just a kid or maybe even he enjoys that program so much that he has a hard time to listen to me. These may seem trivial. However, remember the slide where we talked about how stress happens and recognizing that the story that we tell ourselves, our mental filter, that actually determines how we are going to ultimately manage our stress. So remember that how we perceive an event has a larger impact on how we respond than on the event itself. So recognizing that coping thoughts lead to problem solving situations and um, they can actually decrease our potential of an anger generating situation. So I thought I would include this graph. It's actually called the anger mountain. <laughs> Uh, so just to help us understand the impact of anger generating situation and how it impacts our thinking process. So as you can see on the far left of the graph, um, it basically has our angry arousal and our thinking. So as, as we start to kind of recognize some of our trigger thoughts and we know some of the signs of escalations, um, e escalating behavior, um, we might recognize that um, once we reach that crisis point, our thinking is actually non-existent. Uh, so you're not able to process things clearly. You're not able to think clearly. So we, re we need to recognize what our triggers are first and foremost. We need to know what our signs are of es our escalating signs in order to mitigate situations. So as we recognize um, that we are starting to escalate, this would be actually the, the ideal time to take a perspective purposefully engageable and um, take that time out uh, prior to it climaxing into that crisis phase. This is where people are not able to listen, even have any empathy, think, um, think about any consequences for their actions or words. So all of that happens in that crisis phase. After you hit that crisis mode, this is where the body actually begins to start to recover. It could take up to an hour before you actually kind of get down into that depression phase, uh, where once um, that awareness returns and the assessment of the behavior is exhibited, uh, it can lead to a lot of different feelings depending on how you manage that crisis. It could lead to guilt, maybe regret, um, maybe even that depression. So that self-awareness piece and the ability to take time out before the crisis phase is, uh, is the most important piece. We will talk about more um, like what to do in regards to the timeout process uh, in a few slides from now, but this is basically where you would wanna take that, that timeout is in that escalation phase, but there are rules to taking a timeout. So we're gonna bring your attention to those uh, in a few slides from now. So bringing um, you back to our definition of communication, we know that this is usually based on an exchange of information and it has two important components uh, that require both a good listener as well as a good speaker. So I wanted to go over a few different guidelines for both the listener and the speaker. But before I do that, on a scale of one to 10, so I'm gonna engage you guys in the chat again. Uh, so on a scale of one to 10, one being that you're not a very good listener or you don't consider yourself a very good listener, and 10, basically you're considering yourself basically that expert at listening. So how do you think you would rate yourself as a listener? Would it be closer to that one or maybe closer to 10? Okay, we've got some, some strong listeners out there. Good. Okay, so it can fluctuate a little bit. Good. Somebody else is responding there. Give that a second. Good. 
Okay, I feel that we have some pretty strong listeners in the crowd today. That's excellent. Uh, so Dana, if you do have the opportunity, can you populate in the chat uh, the handout that I had given you in regards to how to recognize um, if you're an active listener or not? So I'll just get Dana to populate that in there. Um, recognizing that even if you don't consider yourself a good listener um, as we go through this but most of you guys think that you are so that's good um, it's always an area that we can strive to improve on and we can develop so uh, just to to kind of note that having trouble with it okay so there's a, a few technical difficulties but we'll have that up for you shortly so the main way to become a better listener is to practice those active listening. So once Dana is able to actually populate that in there, just take a quick look over it. If there's any areas that you can maybe um, focus a little bit more on. Um, it's more importantly, um, trying to in, interpret how we uh, understand the total message that is being sent. So having talked about that active listening, I once actually um, listened to a TED talk by Celeste Headley. And in this talk, she stated that you shouldn't have to go through your active listening checklist if you are in fact truly paying attention. This should be a natural occurrence and you will most likely exhibit most of your active listening checklist when present and truly trying to pay attention. So recognizing that this list is mainly for you to try to identify if there's any areas that you could uh, be better at or if you'd like to develop a little bit further. For instance, maybe it's just reminding yourself to hold off on trying to formulate any responses before the other individual has finished communicating to you. Um, so um, maybe delaying that judgment or any assumptions that you may have in regards to that. So um, those are the guidelines for the listener, but there's also guidelines for the speaker as well. So attempting to use assertive communication when making requests helps to avoid problems. So we want to focus on problems and solutions as opposed to focusing on the person. Ensuring that when you are speaking, you are avoiding making any of those assumptions about what the other person is thinking or what their intentions are. Trying to use those I statements, um, making sure that you're speaking for yourself, uh, you're allowing the listener to reconstruct your experience accurately with an attempt to understand uh, what you are thinking, feeling, and wanting. Speaking clearly and slowly while staying out of the weeds. You want to make sure that you're being brief and you're staying on topic and you're keeping it uh, short and um, to the point. Avoiding what I might call actually kitchen sinking, uh, which is basically bringing up some events um, or things that just don't necessarily have anything to do with the point that you're trying to make. So throwing everything in, including that kitchen sink. So another tip might be to allow the listener to paraphrase what you are saying. Um, this way you can ensure that you are both on the same page and you're also providing the speaker with the opportunity to feel heard as well, okay? So when approaching a difficult conversation, there are some guidelines that can be used for both the speaker as well as the listener. It might actually be useful to agree in advance that you can take that time out if you feel that you need or if you're feeling that you're escalating. So having some of that self-awareness in regards to our body language as well as our paralanguage, allowing both parties the ability to speak without that interruption is hugely important. Um, maybe even coming to that conversation prepared as I mentioned earlier so that you don't get derailed and you can stay on topic. So now what I wanted to do is actually explore some different strategies that can be utilized when having a difficult conversation or even an anger generating conversation. So there's a few avoid and escape strategies that can actually be utilized. Um, we also need to recognize that these are not permanent solutions, uh, yet they can be very effective in preventing further damage to your relationships. So focusing um, on those avoidance strategies first and foremost, uh, they can be most effective with predictable stressors. They help to decrease the chance of an angry confrontation. So especially if the problem would be dealt with better at a later date, recognizing that we don't have to attend every argument that's out there. When exploring planned avoidance, um, this could be something simple like if you don't know um, that you, or 
sorry, if you know that you're tired um, and you aren't feeling the greatest, maybe it is best to avoid that person as to, um, you know, possibly avoid any of those uh that bad communication. Or maybe you know that traffic is something that escalates you and you know that upon your arrival um, to work, you're going to need to have a difficult conversation. You may want to change things up. Maybe, um, you know, maybe that day you're going to take your bike to work or you're going to try to maybe listen to an audiobook or even changing your schedule slightly um, so that you can avoid that, that high traffic time. Um, so all of those could lead to more of a calm response. Uh, to an already, already difficult conversation. It could be even looking at time delays. Um, so maybe you're, you know, um, noting the, to the person who's uh, requesting from th something from you. Um, maybe you're going to state to them, can I get back to you or let me sleep on it? Maybe I can get back to you tomorrow. When looking at avoidance, so the, the, the last one that we're going to talk about there um, is by seeking another method, maybe turning to written communication if you know that it, that conversation usually turns into a yelling match. So maybe you're going to choose to maybe send that person an email or a text or maybe even, you know, writing them a letter in order to avoid that yelling match and that ability to feel heard. So now I want to uh, focus in um, a little bit on those escape strategies. So these are most useful when you want to interrupt your anger response, and it can be used for situations that cannot be avoided. So planning escape strategies will prevent the situation from getting any worse. These two may not be per permanent solutions though. Uh, so recognizing that you you will still need to deal with the situation, um, but these can be, be utilized as well. So when we look at that planned escape, this is usually a useful tool if you know ahead of time that a particular encounter is going to occur. Um, one possibility is keeping the time uh, for such a meeting to a minimum. So maybe you're letting the other person know that you have another engagement that you need to attend to in say an hour or two hours. Um, or um, another alternative is having a third party assist uh, in interrupting that meeting. So maybe after a certain amount of time has passed by, maybe you can ask a friend um, or if you're doing it virtually, you know, maybe have your, your spouse or somebody actually ring the doorbell just to give or allow that pause to happen. The next one might be a distraction. Uh, so distraction is useful when you are likely to dwell on a negative experience. Uh, so if you're focusing um, on more pleasant activities such as hobbies or going for a walk, that can actually uh, reduce the short term discomfort until a long term solution can be put into place. So ultimately, this break can allow you to re-engage more rationally with the with the problem and allowing that process, allowing you to process those emotions that you might be undergoing. And remember what I had stated in a few slides before, when you're de-escalating from being in that crisis, it could take up to an hour in order to, to return to that, uh, that normal. I see that uh, actually Trina was able to, uh, to pop up that active listening handout, perfect. And um, so the next one that I want to talk about is that timeout. So we talk, we started talking about this much earlier. Um, the timeout, this can either be taken spontaneously. So you can excuse yourself maybe to go to the washroom or to get a drink of water, or it can be, um, it can be planned um, where you might agree prior to the discussion. So the two parties are, are allowing um, that timeout to, to happen. Um, so just recognizing that if you have that discussion prior to that difficult conversation, it can alleviate um, those emotions where obviously they don't want to deal with that situation. So maybe agreeing ahead of time uh, with the other party uh, that, you know, if things get a little too much, you might need to take a little bit of a time out uh, just to de-escalate yourself emotionally and to maybe gather your th those thoughts a little bit. So during this time out, uh, if possible, it is important to do some physical activity, like maybe going for a walk or taking a, going for a workout, um, anything that's going to relieve that tension in the body and allow you to come back to that, um, that emotional state that you can be more reasonable. So in the time out, you also need to recognize 
that you also need to call a time back in. It is important to communicate to the other party when you're going to return to the situation to address it and you want to do so as soon as possible. It's also important to note that uh, while you're in that timeout, it is not a time to build on your case or maybe even to gain more ammo in regards to where you're kind of going with that discussion, but it's more that opportunity to relax, maybe do some problem solving and trying to implement or switching that perspective to get those co coping thoughts that we were talking about earlier. Recognize that taking a timeout is not something that is considered weak. It might even be the strongest thing that you can do in order to salvage your relationship and address the situation effectively. Always keeping in mind, you want to make sure that you're seeking first to understand and then you're being understood. So if you are somebody that wants to come to a, com a difficult conversation a little bit more prepared, um, this is just an easy to follow tool um, that can be implemented um, and prepare yourself ahead of time. Uh, so Dana, hopefully you're able to do this, but if you can populate into the chat a few of those um, accompanying documents, um, I just wanted to make sure that those are out there as I know that we are approaching the hour and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so um, I might just have a chance to gloss over this, but I wanted to make sure that you do have those handouts as well. So when we look at the desk script, this is basically describing the situation. The E is for expressing your feelings or thoughts in regards to that situation. The S is there for, to specify what you need or want. And lastly, um, and lastly, what the positive consequence, so that C is for those consequences. So if you can switch those into a positive, um, that, that is most important, okay? So let's walk through these a little bit. So when you describe, when describing the behavior, you need to make sure that you're being objective and you're being non-judgmental. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping it to those facts. So for instance, um, I might state, I've noticed that when I start speaking to you about something important or something that upsets me, you start to do something else like clearing the table. In the statement, I have kept it to the specifics of the situation at hand. I limited myself to the behavior that I can see only. So we don't wanna make any assumptions of what the other person's motives, their attitudes or their character is. So you don't wanna include statements like, you don't seem to care about anything that I have to say, uh, or it makes me feel like you don't have anything, um, you know, that you don't care. Uh, so avoiding also sometimes those character assassinations where you're using words like always, never, or constantly, like you never seem to listen to me. So you wanna make sure that you're being brief and you're not bringing any tidbits of extra information that aren't relevant. So once again, I've noticed that when I start speaking to you about something that upsets me, you start doing something else like clearing the table. And then you want to express um, your reactions, your feelings, your thoughts about what just happened. So you might state, it makes me feel unheard and disrespected. Then you want to specify what you want or need from that situation. So I need you to show that you are interested in what I have to say by not doing anything else and ending with those positive consequences. That way I'm going to feel heard and respected. And we want to make sure that we always try to finish with that. Would you be willing to do that? So there is a blank worksheet in the handout that uh, Dana was able to populate on there. So you can try to plug in your own unique experiences or your own unique situations in there just to see if you can make sure that you're not um, driving anything by emotion or anger and you're basically keeping to, to the point in regards to that. So that brings um, me to the end of this briefing. So uh, just to summarize what we've covered, I wanna make sure that you remember that first rule of communication, which is seek first to understand and then to be understood. Assertive communication is something that is a learned behavior and it needs to be practiced. So remembering the difference between those coping thoughts and those trigger thoughts. Coping thoughts de-escalate you as opposed to those trigger thoughts.
And when approaching a difficult conversation, keeping in mind those guidelines for both the speaker and the listener. And let's not forget that you can come prepared to a conversation just by walking through that little desk script uh, right prior to approaching that. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it, those are the resources. Um, so actually, I'm just going to flip to this one here. Unfortunately, when I tried to, I also had some technical difficulties on Teams today. Uh, so it didn't give me my most recent presentation. Uh, so Dana's going to populate in um, the chat. So I wanted to draw your attention to uh, the first resource that I have there. It's the Conflict and Complaint Management Services. Um, it actually falls under that integrated conflict and can't uh, complaint management and the DRC, so the Dispute Resolution Center, actually falls all under this umbrella. If you want to reach somebody locally, um, this is um, basically like using a, a third party to actually help you navigate any difficult conversations that you may have to have. Um, but both, um, there's two numbers there that Dana populated, so that 4762 and the 5083. They have a great team. Uh, it stays out of the chain of command. If you just want to even, you know, gain some resources or know which avenue you should take, um, they're really good at uh, at helping you de determine that. And then I populated the the rest of the resources that are available as well uh, that we listed at the beginning of the briefing. So having said all of that i am now going to turn my camera back on so hello everyone again uh, so i just wanted to ask does anybody have any um closing remarks any questions any comments anything that they would like to address i have populated on that last uh screen there i have my um, my information so um the best way to get to me or reach me lately um especially through covid is at that martin.lucy at cfmws.com um and if you just have some general comments that you want to make maybe even just uh using our positional mailbox which is the health promotion petawawa at cfmws.com uh, so there's a few ways of getting a hold of us if you do have any questions or you have any comments in regards to the presentations that we've been delivering. Um, I also wanted to make sure that everybody knows that we have um, one more um, presentation that is going to be featured uh, this month, and that will be on label reading. Uh, so that will be um, on Thursday, I believe. Uh, Dana, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's at 10 o'clock. Yes. All right. So from 10 till 11. So um, be sure to join us and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. And if there's no questions, I don't see any hands up and I don't see anything in the chat. 